When it comes to eschatology, that's the study of the end times, there are a whole variety of views on the order of events that we should expect as the end approaches. There are a variety of different views on the details of those events and how literal some of the Bible's teaching is on some of those things, how symbolic. There are even a variety of views on what the world will look like right after Christ's next return. A lot of different views on those things. But regarding the state of the world just before Christ's next coming, there are really only two views. You either believe as a Christian that before Christ returns, this world will look more like heaven or more like hell. Jesus once told a parable in Matthew chapter 13 where he compared the kingdom of God to a uh, a, a landowner who put seeds in the ground, and while his servants were sleeping, his enemy came in and sowed the seeds of weeds. And so after the weeds began to pop up, these servants came rushing to the master and said, Lord, we see weeds everywhere. And he says, yes, this was the work of the enemy. And they say, well, should we pull out the weeds right now? Should we remove the weeds from the wheat? And the master says, no, because if you pull out the weeds now, you'll tear up the wheat along with the weeds. And so leave them both, and they will both grow up until the harvest. The disciples actually asked Jesus to explain the parable. What does that mean, Jesus? And he explained that the one who sows the seed, the good seed, is the Son of Man, Jesus himself, who gives the gospel sown into the world. And the enemy, of course, is the devil who plants seeds, which are those the sons of darkness, as it says there. And that means that we should expect that from now until the end of this age, there will be both a growing of the church and those who will oppose it. So in answer to the question, will this world look more like heaven or more like hell, I guess you could split the middle and say both, depending on how you look at it. The church will certainly be purified and be growing, and every single one of the sheep of Jesus will have been shepherded into the end. He will not lose a single one, and the enemy will grow in strength and size and power. So believers, we should expect there to be fruit until the end, and we should expect there to be hardships and suffering. Paul in our passage today in 2 Timothy, is writing to a young pastor, and this is his final letter, and he knows this is probably the last thing he's ever going to get to say to this young man that he loves. And he's trying to warn him, prepare him for what hardships are coming down the pike. And he tells him what he should expect to encounter as the end draws near. And he says things like this. He says, in the last days, there will be times of difficulty. He gives a list of sins, of vices, that will mark that particular time of the end. He says that evil people will go from bad to worse. He says that believers who live in that day must be certainly prepared for inevitable suffering. And he says that in the end, people will not endure sound teaching, but they will run after teachers who promote and approve of their sin. This is what Paul tells Timothy to expect as the end approaches. This morning, I want to turn to that passage. We've been in 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4 uh, for the past several weeks. Today, I'm going to wrap up our time in this portion of Scripture. Next week, the plan is to jump back into John chapter 6. So you can prep ahead of time if you'd like, but right now, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy 4. I'm going to read through verses 1 through 5. This will conclude this series. And my hope will be to do for you much what Paul was doing for Timothy. Prepare you for whatever and whenever the end is going to come. Refine expectations of what we should imagine things will look like when we get there. And also to equip and prepare you well to face whatever it is you're going to have to face. So let's read together 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. 
And then I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll just go back through and unpack a couple verses at a time. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from the listening to the truth and wander off in the midst. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Lord, what a, what a helpful passage this is. It is direct instruction, inspired by your Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, to his young disciple Timothy, whom he loves, desiring godliness, desiring to be prepared for hardship, desiring the joy that comes with a fruitful ministry. Lord, we want those things. We want to be able to endure hardship. We want to rely on your word. We want it to shape us. We want the joy of fulfilling ministry. And so, Lord, please use this word to do that. And we appeal to you in the name of Jesus, by the power of your spirit. Amen. So he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom. That's the first verse. Talk about a setup. Talk about a get ready. This is what you must do. He is serious about this command. As verse 1 makes it very clear, he's about to say something vital, something critical. If you don't do anything else, do this. And the charge immediately follows. What is the charge? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, this shouldn't be surprising if this is what comes next from Paul when he's prepping Timothy. This is what you're going to hear. This is not, we don't go, whoa, wasn't seeing that coming. Yeah, yeah, we knew exactly what was coming. If we've been reading anything about what Paul tells Timothy, he just finished explaining what the Word of God is used for. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. This is the preceding verse, it's not at all surprising he's telling, now take that stick and run with it. Use the word to equip the church. Now, just so just you see this also, back in 1 Timothy, an earlier letter that he sent to the same young pastor, he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. It's all the stuff he's always told this young guy. Preaching is an absolutely fundamental part of the Christian life. This is all over, not only Old Testament, but New Testament. Let me show you a few passages where you see this flow, the necessity of the preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Acts 10, 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul writes, for I have preached the gospel. That gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul is saying, I can't help it. I, I can't not preach the gospel. It's all I've got to offer to others. If you've ever wondered why it is that our church and Protestant churches like ours make so much of the preaching, it's intentional. It's because of this. Time and time again, the preaching of the word is the instrument designed by God to build the kingdom, to reach the lost, and to strengthen believers. It is true that God has used books and articles and videos and podcasts and debates and songs and poems and the modeling of good works to draw people to Him. Yes, that is true. 
but the primary delivery vehicle for the gospel is preaching, the proclamation of the word of God. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So when, here's the question, when are pastors like Timothy allowed to stop preaching the gospel? Never, never. This is the charge. And we see that because he even makes it clear, in season and out of season. That's what needs to be ready with this gospel proclamation, in season and out of season. Now, what does that mean? You see the word season. Does that mean uh, preach winter, spring, summer, fall? No, it's, it's not that kind of season. It's the same word that would be used for opportunity or convenience. Uh, favorableness. So in other words, it would read like this. Uh, preach the word when it is favorable and when it is unfavorable. Preach the word when it is convenient and inconvenient. Preach the word when it is received as fashionable by the culture and when it is rejected as unfashionable by the culture. That's what he's saying. We may never put our, our finger in the wind, so to speak, to feel which way it blows, and the prevailing winds of the culture demand, no, it's not time for preaching today. It is always time for preaching the gospel. Now, I believe, as I suspect many of you do, that we are in an out-of-season moment in America. We are in a season where the proclamation of all of the truths of God's word do not garner respect from the world, but receive hatred. This is exactly as the Bible predicted and promised. Christians have had our day in the sun in America. And regardless as to what you think the future will hold for us, it is important to acknowledge that those days are past to us as for now. And I'm not saying this as a point of defeatism at all. No victimhood, no woe is me, oh, why are we not leading the charge? I'm not saying it in that way at all. I'm saying this is a matter of fact that must be realized so that we can reposture for victory. Here's why I think this is so important. I think this is critical to acknowledge that we are no longer on the uptick as believers. We are no longer in the cultural graces of the world around us. And we have to see and know this so that we get our expectations right. I mean, maybe imagine it this way. Imagine you're on a football team and you're marching downfield. You're on offense. Your team has the ball and somebody fumbles the ball. And the defense, the opposition, picks up the ball. If you don't acknowledge that and realize that in that moment everything changed, you went from offense to defense in a second. If you continue just to charge towards that end zone, you guarantee the opposition will score. It is vital that Christians see the landscape around us and know what to expect. And if we're expecting, man, we're going to say, say these things and the world's going to love it. Wrong. Wrong. And we must strategize with that in mind. Our unique strategies, our expectations should change. Even our preparation and anticipation of future suffering must change when we see that we're on cultural defense, not on cultural offense in these ways. But what must never change is the gospel or the proclamation of it. There are things that we are never, ever permitted to shift, adjust, sharp edges to shave off. We must not budge with truth. What do we mean by the gospel? What do we mean by this good news of Jesus Christ? If you don't know that, you need to know. The gospel, that word gospel means good news. We have good news. News worth celebrating. 
that you're a sinner, that your sins are are seen as as, as filthy before the Lord. They cause separation. His holiness cannot accommodate our sin. He cannot put up with our sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and that the wages of sin is death. This is why everywhere we look, we see death, we see devastation, we see war, we see poverty, we see pain, we see sickness. Everywhere we look, this world is broken and fallen because of sin. Sin has caused that. And every single one of us is a carrier. We are all contributors to this global pandemic, all of us. And our only hope is to be cured once and for all of that sin. The Lord, in His goodness, sends His perfect Son, Jesus, to live a life on this earth that we should have lived. He lived perfect. He lived blameless. And God put Him on the cross as a sacrifice that it would be His life for ours. And the trade comes when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and so be saved. You don't get Christ's death for you by you doing good things, by you stopping doing those bad things, by your good intentions, but only by faith alone. That's our gospel. Our gospel is that your works got you into this mess. They cannot get you out of this mess. Instead, you are to simply repent of your sins and turn in faith to Christ. That's your only hope. And believe that his sacrifice is sufficient for all the punishment needed for you to be placed on him. And just as this perfect Jesus dies and he is buried in a tomb, and three days later he raises from the dead is to show that he has power over death. He is who he said that he is. And that, that same Jesus who's the first fruits of the resurrection, the first to raise again in that way, he will bring all of those who have died in belief into the kingdom with him. We must repent and believe. The word does this work. The word shows us our error, shows us our sin, shows us our fault, and points us to the solution. This is why Paul says, preach the word. Timothy, you're a smart guy. I'm sure you have lots of good tips and tricks for life. That's not what he's telling him to do. He's telling him, just preach the word. Give them what you know to be true in season and out of season. And what should he do with it? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. This is similar to the list that he just gave a verse before. At the end of chapter 3, that's what the Bible's for. It's what it does. Just use it for what it's supposed to be used for. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. The Bible has use for our lives. It has use. It's supposed to be doing things. It's supposed to make a change. A person who's committed time in his or her day to the Word, day in, day out, for weeks and months and years at a time, it will have an effect. It will change you from the inside out. It'll change the way you believe and the way that you think and the way that you behave. You will be marked different because of the inputs that you put into your life. You know, I'm just going to make a point about something that you may have observed as I have. There are cultural prophets in any age, and we have them in our age. These are people who do not have the Spirit of God in them. They're not believers. They're not Christians. They're not, they're not preachers of righteousness driving people to the Bible. But in God's common grace, they have stumbled upon obvious truths. And they have seen how foolish behavior hurts people in the long run. And how wise behavior helps people in the long run. And we have these cultural prophets in our day. And in many cases, they have largely replaced preachers and pastors. I'm talking about the guys like the Jordan Petersons of the world. The kind of people who say things that resonate with something inside of people. And if you don't know this, there are so many, especially young men, sprinting towards these voices. They are aching for a preacher who will tell them something that will change their lives. They're dying for it. They're crying out for it. We do hear these cultural voices. We do hear those people out there because they've seen the folly of certain ways of living and they are speaking to those who crave direction. They have become shepherds to sheep without the shepherds. Quite simply, what we're seeing is the craving for discipleship being met by people in the world. 
Why is this? Why does this happen? Why is it that so many young men are running off to these kinds of guys? Why is it that even young Christian men are running off to worldly voices who do say some measure of common grace truth? Why? Because for many of them, in their experiences, preachers and pastors stopped saying anything useful a long time ago. There's a handful of reasons as to why this might be the case. Some, some preachers stopped preaching the power of God and simply turned sermons into self-help seminars that resemble more TED Talks than they do the voice in a wilderness authoritatively crying out, repent. And believe. So afraid to offend, they never rebuke, reprove, exhort with the authority of Scripture. For others, for other pastor preacher types, I think that it's the baby in the bathwater thing. It's like, well, I don't want to be anything like the TED Talk guy. I don't want to say anything like those guys out there. So they dive over the road, falling into the ditch on the other side. They are so resolved to not sound like the self-help seminar that they never provide any help. They don't say anything that's practical and helpful. Instead, the sermons oftentimes just sound like somebody reading a commentary out loud. Pontificating on doctrines. Sermons sound much, much less like the earnest plea for how a man or woman of God ought to live. I want to read something from Charles Spurgeon. This is a helpful quote that I found recently. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a 19th century uh, preacher over in England who is known by many as the prince of preachers, powerful orator, amazing lover of the gospel and truth, and herald of righteousness. The people still today are well served by reading what he said about truth. This is what he writes. There are preachers who care very little, little who care very little whether they are listened to or not, so long as they can hold on through the allotted time. It is of very small importance to them whether their people hear for eternity or hear in vain. The sooner such ministers sleep in the churchyard and preach from the verse on their gravestones, the better. I have no right to attention unless I know how to command it. You must attract the fish to your hook, and if they do not come, you should not blame, you should blame the fishermen and not the hook. In order to get attention, the first golden rule is always say something worth hearing. Spurgeon, who had preached for decades with great fruitfulness in his ministry, wrote pages and pages and sermons and sermons about the preacher, about the pastor, and about how in his day so many had just fallen into that pontification mindlessly reading just doctrines out loud while people were crying out, help me, help me, help me. The gospel has use, but it has been so neutered, it has been so robbed of all of its power, it's been so stripped of its practical use that many have run to try to find wisdom elsewhere. You know, I heard a story once about a a lumberjack who was felling trees with his axe in the woods and a traveling salesman came along. And, and produced a chainsaw from his bags and said, hey, I'll sell you this chainsaw. It will improve your labors. Everything will be easier for you to accomplish, and you'll get more of your work done. Sounded good to the lumberjack, and so he purchased the chainsaw. A few days later, he had to admit that his labor was harder, and the number of trees that he was able to cut down has reduced so that it's way more challenging for a much lesser result. And so out of frustration, he finally marches back into town and finds the traveling salesman and tells him, what did you do? You sold me this piece of junk. This has made everything so much harder. Salesman confused. He says, there must be something wrong. And he assumed that there must be a defect to that chainsaw. And so he took the chainsaw from the man and said, let's see what's wrong. And he grabbed the pole cord and fired it into life, the typical chainsaw. And the lumberjack jumped back and said, what's that sound? I'm waiting for the late arrivers. You see, so many people have been handed the word of God, but not shown how to use it. No one's discipled them. No one's one's said, you see these issues in your life? You see these things that you're aiming towards? You see what you're doing? Look, 
The word has something to say about that. This is what it's for. This, 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 is, this is for you to apply every day in your life. This is not just the thing that the person reads and goes, whoa, saving faith in Christ. They get saved and then boom, all the Bibles disappear because they don't need them anymore. They're a believer now. No, this is for every part of your life and your faith. This is to help you every single day. Use the word, Timothy. Be ready to preach it. Reprove with it. Rebuke with it. Exhort. We must not only proclaim how to become saved by the gospel, but show people how to use it. It's a sword, after all. And which of you would hand to your child a sword and say, good luck? We need to be taught. We need to be trained. We need to become familiar with it. We should take this seriously. Guys, this book should change everything. It should change everything about your life. It has something to say about every single category of your life. And I think that for many preachers, they've heard some in the world provide practical guidance on how to spend your money, practical guidance on how to raise your children, practical guidance on how to stay fit, practical guidance on how to run a business, practical guidance in all these other areas of life. And so the pastors have looked out and seen this and been like, well, the market's saturated, so I'm going to pigeonhole into the doctrine of eschatology. That's going to be my thing. And I think that that has happened in large measure in so many places in our world. I speak to the young men. The reason that so many are driven to pastors, to preachers, is because as we're going to see in a moment, everybody is. Everybody is. There's no point at which people run away from the preachers. They just run to new ones. We should be telling young men to stand straight, clean their room, make their beds, get their schedule in order, shape their lives, wake up every morning like it's training for the war. We should be doing that, not the world, not leaving it to those who are devoid of the Spirit. Christian men should be discipling other Christian men and holding the word and say, no, no, let me show you how to do this by the power of the Spirit and trust in His Holy Word. Let me show you how to do that thing that you're struggling with, that you're trying to figure out. You think this has nothing to say about how to defeat your issues with pornography? You, th you think this has nothing to say with you outperforming the others in your life at work so that you can work as though working for the Lord with all your heart and not for men? You don't think the word has something to say about that? All of the areas of your life are to be adjusted, adapted, and trained by the word. These are not simply innocuous things of strengths and weaknesses that we must figure out in our lives. We need to manage battles of sin and righteousness. And brothers and sisters, we should be doing this as believers far better than guys like Jordan Peterson and David Goggins and Jocko Willink. We should be doing that. Because only we can do it pointing to the word of God by the power of his spirit. Because many will try to adjust their life and change a few things and all of it will be in vain if they have not the Spirit of God in them. And if the devil cannot get you to deny the truth and to join his side, he'll happily settle for keeping you too idle to put your faith into action. The word is for shaping. And how should Timothy consider the longevity or the duration of this preaching? With patience, complete patience and teaching. Complete patience and teaching. Why would he tell them that? Been a parent, worked with kids. You might know that oftentimes you have to teach your kids the same thing over and over and over and over. Have I not? I, I know I've told you this. I know I've shown you how to do this. I know I've explained this to you. Be patient. You're going to need to hear it over and over and over and over again. Complete patience and teaching. Paul is telling Timothy, you're going to have to say the same things over and 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 over again. Don't get frustrated by this. Don't get exasperated by it. Christians, pastors must preach the word of God. Pastors must preach the word of God. That means that Christians must hear the word of God. 
When? In season and out of season. You need preaching in your life. You, you need preaching from the Word of God in your life. You need it all the time. You need a steady diet of it. He's not talking about preaching to the stars. He's not talking about preaching to the, to the, to the wilds. He's talking about preaching to the believers that he's building up in the church. That's what he's doing. So Christians, you need this. This is God's prescribed method. We're reaching the lost, as we've already seen in some of those passages I read, but it's also the prescribed method for strengthening believers, for equipping the saints. Kids, have you ever built anything out of Legos? Kids built out of Legos? <laughs> All right. Have you, have, you ever gotten, have you ever built something kind of big out of Legos? Like not the, just a little set, but once you, you, know, you get into the bigger set, and you get a few pages into the Lego thing. I'm very familiar with Legos in my house. I've stepped on many. And as you get to a certain page and finally go to put the, the six-nub Lego in the spot, but there's only four space, uh, four nub spot left. What? And what do you do? You look back at the manual and you're like, well, that's supposed to be a six nub spot and it's only a four. What happened? Somewhere along, somewhere along the line, you messed up. Somewhere you got to go back page after page and you got to take down the rows of Legos you put in until you get back to, ah, I put the red one too close to the black one. And then you change it. And then you move forward. Guys, think seriously like this. The attention that you give to God's word should be even more than that. Got that? You need to look at the word like that, man. You need to look at it and look at your life and build upon that rock. And when you get to a point in your life that something's not fitting, it's not working, this is not okay. This is joy robbing. This is, this is not what the Father had in mind for me. What are you to do? Don't throw this out and try to solve it on your own. Go back to it. Figure out where you went wrong and make the change. You need a steady diet of the word in your life, and you need those around you who are going to preach and proclaim the word fearlessly with rebuke, reproving, exhorting, and patience and teaching. It is such an essential part of the Christian life. Christians must prioritize the preaching of the word. And you'll notice that's what he's telling them. But what is it that he's supposed to preach? The word. Just to make sure that's clear. Stick to the text. That's what they need to hear. They need to hear the word of God. It speaks to every part of your life. Whether or not a pastor, a preacher picks a book and goes verse by verse or tends to hop around more and says, here, I'll preach this part and then I'll preach this part and preach this part. That is not the big issue. We must not avoid any hard stuff. We must let the word speak to the people. That's what must happen. Acts 20, 26 through 27, Paul is getting ready to leave the Ephesian church that he'd been with for a long time. He'd been with them for about three years. He'd been their regular preacher, discipler for all that time. He's getting ready to leave. And as he's leaving, he says this about his heart's condition. He feels, I can have peace. I know that I didn't hold anything back from you. This is what he says, therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I mean, it wasn't a part that Paul was like, ah, I don't want to get in trouble talking about that part. There also wasn't a part like, ah, that, that might be out of reach. Maybe they're younger in the faith. Maybe they need something else. Maybe there's something, you know, maybe a few years from now they'll be ready for these deeper truths. No, he didn't hold back on anything. Every good thing. Now you might ask, as I ask, when I get to the end of a couple verses like this, if this is so clear, it's just crystal clear. Why have so many churches stopped doing it? Well, Paul tells us in the next couple of verses, he warns Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So time's coming, it's going to get really bad. 
And how will the people respond to the preaching of the word? Timothy, you're going to keep preaching the word. You're going to keep holding fast to what is true. You're going to run the race as I have. You are going to do all the good things, Timothy, that I'm telling you to do. Because I, I know the spirit of God is in you. And when you do that, people will leave. The day is coming where faithful preaching will not be endured any longer. They will not put up with it. And why? Why won't they endure it? Because their ears are itching. What an interesting, what an interesting illustration. You've heard, you've heard this if you're familiar with the Bible. You've heard that idea of itching ears, people running off to find those who will, who will, scratch, who will scratch that itch. Okay? What's the idea here? They want and crave to hear somebody approving of their sin. That's what they want to hear. They're aching for somebody to say that. And they will look until they find it. And they will listen until they hear that accommodation or that celebration or that approval. That's what they're going to do. They're not going to endure sound teaching, but their itching ears will drive them away from the sound teaching. And they will find somebody else. We all naturally crave preaching. We all want to hear from somebody. And that's what's interesting here. This is not a day void of preachers. This is not a day where churches have all shuttered their doors. That's not what's going on here. In fact, one of the things we see even in the book of Revelation as it describes the end, there's a lot of religious worship happening. A lot. In fact, by the time we get to the end, I've become convinced by Scripture there are no atheists left. Everyone believes in God to some, some degree and in some way. But they hate him. That's why they shake their fist at him when judgment comes. And it's why they rush off to worship their gods in an appeal that their gods would save them from the judgment from the true God. And so here, people are running off to preachers. They will find those preachers. Paul does not imagine a day where people stop going to the preachers in the future. They're just going to find new ones. This is basic supply and demand principles. Basic supply and demand. The people demand to hear certain things, and weak or wicked men will rise up to supply them, to meet the supply. That's exactly how it works. If there's a demand, somebody will supply and how many? Well, they'll accumulate them, so probably many. Jesus says in Matthew 24, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So I'm assuming there's not just one guy at the top of an org chart, pyramid scheme somewhere. I think this is probably lots of different voices. But in our sin, people don't merely want the freedom to pursue their desires uninhibited. They crave for others to approve of those desires. Romans 1.32 says, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This means that in the last days, people will demand that preachers approve of their desires, and plenty will happily oblige. So sometimes you might ask the question, as I have, is, is, this, is it the leaders who mislead all these well-meaning people? Oh, man, false prophets showed up and all these people, we just want to do the right thing. We just want to honor God, and he's saying that's how we do it. No, that is not how Paul imagines this future. He says, they will go find someone to hire. They'll go get their own. So it's not a group of innocent, albeit gullible people, well-meaning, being led astray by particularly cunning and deceptive individuals. They are the driver Sometimes the Bible describes the false prophets being the driver. Sometimes it describes the folly being those who drive the false teaching. But they will want salvation without repentance. They'll want blessing without submission to God. And they will find someone who will tailor his sermons to meet those desires. So what should Timothy do as a result? Unsurprisingly... 
He says, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Keep, keep doing what you're supposed to do, Timothy. Keep doing it. As for you, not like them. Don't be like them. As for you, sober-minded. Sober, what's that? that's a great line also. If you're familiar with Bible language, you might just kind of roll over that one. But what does that mean, sober-minded? Well, think about the opposite. Think of like a, a, someone who's not sober but drunk. Stumble around, uh, quickly agitated, uh, hard to keep uh, focused on things. In fact, if a police officer were to pull someone over who they suspected of drunk driving, they, they might have them walk a line. Why? Why would they have somebody who they suspect being drunk walk a line? Because they can't do it. They'll, 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 they'll aim at a point and they'll waver. Paul is saying, have your mind disciplined to be sober. Do, think what you're, what you're supposed to think. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't get distracted. Uh, in fact, we see another comparison of this in Ephesians 4, uh, that we are to become mature, pursue maturity in the faith, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. No, no, no. Don't let your mind wander sober, straight. Timothy will need a disciplined mind. Don't get distracted, Timothy. Don't fall off your plan. Endure suffering. Why? He's already told them this. He's already told them that everyone who seeks to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He's told them multiple times in the two letters he's written to them. Just like me, just as I'm suffering, Timothy, you two are going to have to suffer. This is the way that it'll go. Get ready for it. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Share the gospel. Continue the kingdom building work. Stay the course and don't waver. I do believe that in the end, hostility to Christians will increase. I think it's, I think it's everywhere in the Bible. I don't think that we ever are going to get to a point that certain Christians in the future will go, man, we don't even need these passages of the New Testament because everything's so great. I don't believe it. I think it's going to heat up. And when it does, what are we to do? Go underground? Refuse to share the gospel? Be so afraid of suffering that we won't confront the wickedness of the world, and bring truth to the lost? Nope. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the ministry. This is not the time to say, well, someone else will build the kingdom. This is, this is getting, getting hot out there. No, keep doing what you're supposed to do. I'm at the end of my sermon, but I can't help but just have in mind right now, I have to suspect that there may be some young men, in particular in this, this room right now, Talking about preachers, I think that's a, that's a role for men in the New Testament, um, in the church, in the church setting. Uh, I think there might be some men here who uh, the Lord is going to build into, work into, and you're going to become preachers. You're going to become preachers. What, what would I say to you? I'd say do exactly what Paul is saying here. Gear yourself up for this. Be prepared for hostility from the world. And I would suggest pretty quickly... You go out and pick a fight with the world. Go out and pick a fight with the world. And the reason I mean that, and the reason I say that, is because I think that we will all be tempted by cowardice in a whole bunch of different ways. And I think that one way that pastors can be tempted by cowardice is with the same old fear of man lie that has been told since the beginning. It is easy, it is easy to throw punches at those who will not punch you back. It is not hard to pick a fight with people in the church. It's not hard to nitpick about the things that you don't like about the way your brother down the street preaches and does his thing. It's not hard to do that. But pick a fight with someone who will punch back and see what happens. You want to be a preacher... If you want to be a faithful minister of the gospel, get ready for suffering. Prepare yourself to endure. Remain sober-minded no matter what comes at you. Rigidly hold to the Bible no matter what anybody else says. Because that's how the error begins. Have you seen it? 
What is it that happened? If the people left the true preaching, gospel preaching churches and sought to find others who said they were pastors and were going to preach these things, if they went and no, they couldn't find them. It was a deficit of those. I'm not going to move on the gospel. Sorry, I'm not pivoting on this. This is what it says. And there might be hope for that culture and at that time. For those who are preparing yourself, be sober-minded, prep for this. If you want to learn how to preach, if you want to be helped and discipled in any of this, get to know your word. I'll offer you everything that I could possibly offer you that I've learned in doing this so that we can multiply that out. If you're not a believer here today, I'm going to say this one more time to you because I, I just I feel a desire to offer this up again. If you're not a Christian today, you're like, I don't know what I even believe about the gospel. I'm telling you right now, the word of God is true. This is what we want to point you to. This is what you want you leaving here with. We want you knowing that this is what we trust in. We're not just trying to point to some, some list of wisdoms that we think make a lot of sense and have stood the test of time. We're not trying to point you to personalities that do a really great job leading through difficulties. We're not trying to sell you a bunch of books. There's no pyramid scheme here for us. This is it. We want you to trust the word of God. We want for this to do the work in your life. We want for this to shape and change every single thing about you. And that begins by your repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. So before you leave here today, please stop. Talk to any believer in this place. Meet me up here, any other of the members in the back, those who are uh, meeting and greeting outside, and we will talk to you about the gospel, and we will share with you what is in this, because this is what you need. Because we want to preach the word in season and out. Let's pray. Lord, without your word, we have nothing, nothing to offer the world. We have nothing to offer. All the good that we have are... It has come through the good and blessed gift of the teaching that has descended down to us, preserved through the ages from the hand of these disciples and prophets of old, who have written in accordance with the Holy Spirit that you, God, have given us this word. And so, Lord, let us be a church, let us be a body of people who refuse to waver on it. Let us be those who commit to it, who stick strong to it, who expect hostility, who expect the world to waver and to shift and to fall, fumble all over themselves. But Lord, let us be rigidly committed to what your word says, no matter the cost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.